The Apollo 13 Mission, 1970. On April 11, 1970, at 1313 Central Standard Time, the world watched with bated breath as NASA's Apollo 13 mission blasted off from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The mission, commanded by veteran astronaut James A. Lovell Jr., with Jack Swigert as the command module pilot and Fred Hayes as the lunar module pilot, was intended to be NASA's third manned lunar landing. However, what unfolded over the next several days would turn a routine mission into one of the most dramatic and harrowing episodes in space exploration history. The Apollo 13 mission began with the same optimism and high expectations that had characterized the Apollo program since its inception. Following the success of Apollo 11, which had seen Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin take humanity's first steps on the moon, and the follow-up triumph of Apollo 12, the American space program was riding high on a wave of public enthusiasm and scientific achievement. The mission's objective was straightforward. Land on the moon in the From Morrow Highlands a region chosen for its scientific interest due to the presence of formations thought to be ejected from the impact that formed the Imbrium Basin, one of the moon's most significant craters. Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes had trained extensively for the mission, familiarizing themselves with every aspect of the spacecraft, the lunar surface, and the experiments they would conduct. As Apollo 13 hurtled towards the moon, everything appeared to be going smoothly. The spacecraft had completed its translunar injection, the burn that set it on course for the moon, and the crew was settling into their routine. But on the evening of April 13th, roughly 56 hours into the mission, disaster struck. At approximately 9.08 p.m. Central Standard Time on April 13th, 1970, as the spacecraft was about 200,000 miles from Earth, the crew was instructed to perform a routine stir of the cryogenic oxygen tanks. These tanks, located in the service module, stored liquid oxygen used to generate electricity, water, and breathable air for the astronauts. The procedure was meant to prevent the oxygen from stratifying, ensuring an even flow to the fuel cells. When Swigert flipped the switch to stir the tanks, a violent explosion rocked the spacecraft. Warning lights flashed, and the control panel lit up like a Christmas tree. The astronauts were suddenly aware that something was seriously wrong. Lovell famously radioed back to Mission Control in Houston. Houston, we've had a problem. The explosion had been catastrophic. One of the oxygen tanks had ruptured, damaging the service module and causing the loss of the majority of the spacecraft's oxygen supply. This, in turn, led to the loss of electrical power from the fuel cells. The mission to land on the moon was immediately aborted. The new mission was now to bring the crew safely back to Earth. In the minutes and hours following the explosion, the situation inside the spacecraft grew increasingly dire. Without the oxygen and power from the damaged service module, the command module, Odyssey, would not be able to sustain the crew for the duration of the return journey. The lunar module, Aquarius, originally designed to support two astronauts for a brief stay on the moon, was repurposed as a lifeboat to house all three astronauts and provide life support. The lunar module had its own oxygen supply, batteries, and propulsion system, which would be crucial for the crew's survival. However, it was not designed to support three men for the four days it would take to return to Earth. The first order of business was to shut down nearly all the systems on both the command and lunar modules to conserve power and resources. This meant that the crew had to endure freezing temperatures, as the lack of electrical power meant no heating inside the spacecraft. With the spacecraft crippled, Mission Control had to devise a strategy to bring the astronauts home. The initial plan was to execute a free return trajectory, where the spacecraft would loop around the moon and be slingshot back to Earth using the moon's gravity. However, the damage to the service module meant that critical course correction burns would be required and these had to be executed with extreme precision to ensure the spacecraft re-entered Earth's atmosphere at the correct angle. To make matters worse, the crew faced a buildup of carbon dioxide inside the spacecraft. The lunar module's carbon dioxide scrubbers were designed for two men, not three, and they quickly became saturated. The crew's only hope was to adapt the scrubbers from the command module for use in the lunar module. This required a makeshift solution involving duct tape, plastic bags, and manual dexterity, a jerry-rigged contraption that would later be dubbed the mailbox by the crew. 
Amazingly, it worked, and the CO2 levels began to drop. As Apollo 13 swung around the far side of the moon, the astronauts were treated to a sight few have seen. A close-up view of the moon's surface, illuminated by the distant sun, with Earth a small, blued in the vast blackness of space. But there was little time to enjoy the view. The crew and mission control had to focus on executing the burns that would bring them home. One of the most critical moments came when the crew had to perform a 14-second burn using the lunar module's descent engine to adjust their trajectory. With their guidance systems shut down to save power, Lovell had to manually steer the spacecraft using the Earth's Terminator, the line dividing day and night on Earth, as a reference point. The burn was successful, but it was a white-knuckle moment for everyone involved. Despite the tremendous challenges, the crew managed to stay in relatively good spirits, even as their situation grew increasingly uncomfortable. They rationed water, sipped lukewarm coffee, and endured the bitter cold. They slept in short shifts, huddled together in the tiny lunar module, all while Mission Control in Houston worked tirelessly to find solutions to the myriad problems that arose. As they neared Earth, there was still one final hurdle to overcome, reentry. The command module, Odyssey, which had been shut down for days, had to be powered back up. The sequence for doing this had never been tested under such conditions, and there were concerns that the module's heat shield might have been damaged by the explosion. Without a functioning heat shield, the module would burn up upon reentry. But the crew had no choice but to trust in the expertise of the engineers and technicians back in Houston. With time running out, they powered up the command module, jettisoned the damaged service module, and separated from the lunar module, which had served them so well as a lifeboat. Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes strapped into their seats, bracing themselves for the fiery plunge through Earth's atmosphere. On April 17, 1970, for days after the explosion, Apollo 13 re-entered Earth's atmosphere. The tension in mission control was palpable as the capsule streaked across the sky, generating a plasma that temporarily blocked all communication. For several agonizing minutes, there was silence. Then, as the capsule emerged from the blackout, mission control picked up the signal. Odyssey was intact, and the crew was alive. The command module splashed down safely in the Pacific Ocean, where the astronauts were quickly recovered by the USS Iwo Jima. Despite the ordeal they had endured, Lovell, Swigert, and Hayes were in good health, a testament to their resilience and the skill of everyone involved in the mission. The world celebrated their safe return, and Apollo 13 was hailed as a successful failure. Though the mission had failed to achieve its primary objective of landing on the moon, it had demonstrated the incredible ingenuity, teamwork, and determination of NASA's astronauts, engineers, and mission controllers. The phrase, Houston, we've had a problem, became part of the cultural lexicon. A reminder of how close Apollo 13 came to disaster and how the human spirit prevailed against the odds. In the years since Apollo 13, the mission has been studied extensively, both for the technical lessons it offered and for the human drama that unfolded. The mission was later immortalized in the 1995 film Apollo 13, directed by Ron Howard and starring Tom Hanks as Jim Lovell, which brought the story to a new generation. For NASA, the mission was a wake-up call, highlighting the importance of meticulous planning, contingency procedures, and the need for constant vigilance in space exploration. The lessons learned from Apollo 13 were incorporated into subsequent missions, ensuring that the mistakes made were not repeated. Jim Lovell, who had already been a veteran of spaceflight before Apollo 13, never flew in space again, but he remained an iconic figure in the history of space exploration. Fred Hayes continued his career at NASA, serving as backup commander for the Apollo Soyuz test project and later worked in the space shuttle program. Jack Swigert, who had been a last minute replacement on Apollo 13, went on to a career in politics, being elected to the U.S. House of Representatives though he sadly passed away before taking office. Apollo 13's legacy is one of hope, courage, and the relentless pursuit of knowledge. It reminds us that even in the face of seemingly insurmountable challenges, humanity has the ability to overcome adversity through ingenuity, teamwork, and determination. As we continue to explore the frontiers of space, 
The story of Apollo 13 serves as both a cautionary tale and a source of inspiration, proving that even in our darkest moments, we can find the strength to prevail.